I want to introduce um, our next session on AI and amplifying human abilities. And as I spoke before, we really wanted to reframe this conversation uh, to um, counter the prevailing discussions around automation or uh, the, uh, the fascination around singularity and really go back to our roots uh, with computer science research. Uh, go back to uh, the initial goal of augmenting human intellect and then show the progress that our field has made and not even just around intellect or thought or collaboration but pushing even further. So we have a terrific panel and plenary speakers set up for you today. Logistic wise, I'm gonna introduce Thad. He's gonna come up and give our plenary and then I'll ask the panelists to join us and we'll have their presentations and then open discussion as well. So with that, I'd like to introduce Thad Starner. So uh, Thad's bio accurately reads, uh, he's a wearable computing pioneer um, because he has worn one form or another of a heads up display uh, since 1993. Um, he is a professor of computing at Georgia Tech and he and I have been colleagues for 19 plus years and he's also the technical lead on Google Glass. His projects have uh, run the gamut from a wireless glove that teaches people how to play piano and is now being used the same te techniques around pass passive haptic rehabilitation uh, around stroke rehab. Um, he has, and I attest to this, um, worked on two-way communication technology for dolphins in the wild. Um, and you have to pay attention to the frequencies that you use, because if you use the wrong frequencies, you attract sharks. Um, that's an actual result from that project that I remember. Um, speaking of other animals, a uh, long-standing collaborator with Millie Jackson on wearable technology for working dogs. So these are assistant dogs for people with disabilities, as well as uh, police dogs, uh, dogs in the military used for, for sniffing out bombs. Um, and they actually cheat in their laboratory experiments, just like people do. Um, he has worked on recovering phrase level uh, information from brain signals, so ask him how to do that, but it involves the motor cortex and recognizing the physical signs around uh, sign language. Um, and he's also worked on recognizing English uh, speech uh, without sound utterances. Um, he was elected to the Chi Academy in 2017, um, and again, I've been his colleague for 19 years. Um, it's a blast to teach with that because he always has the notes like right there. Um, so I think this is a terrific way for us to start our discussions and welcome Thad to the podium. Yay. Thank you, Beth, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to to put together a fun talk. At least I think it's fun, hopefully you will too. Um, augmenting intellect is one of the first things that the founders of computer science thought about. And I'll show you a, bit, a little bit of that, about that in the future uh, here. But um, along the way, in computer science, we've seen about three different ways, three different primary ways of augmenting human intellect or, or reaching um, a higher level of intellect. One is networking humans together. And that's what we've been doing with the internet. Um, being able to collaborate seamlessly, quickly, allows us to do things we couldn't do before. Another way is making artificial intelligence. Um, we can make these machines that are very good at very narrow things, like the world's best Go player right now is a machine learning algorithm that learned to play by playing itself five million times. Um, so we've been getting some success in some very narrow areas there. But the one I'm really excited about is augmenting intellect, augmenting intelligence. We actually combine machines with our own brains in order to actually um, make something that's smarter than we are. Now, one way you can think about augmenting intellect is simple things like web search, right? If I have a rash on my baby's head, this is the first thing I do is I type on rash on baby's head into Google and I get some results. And that's really changed our ability to rapidly diagnose and uh, act on things in our lives, no matter what it is. And now that we have it on our mobile phones, you know, we do it all the time. And partially that is by design by Larry Page. Larry um, was uh, uh, working with me on glass. And uh, one time when we were talking together about what was the real importance of wearable computing was, he turned to me and said, Thad, we're doing glass because it reduces the time between intention and action. Now, I've been working in wearable computing for about, since 1990, and that one phrase 
stuck with me. That was the right way to say it. If you look at, that's what Larry has been doing at Google ever since the beginning. The web page for Google is as simple as it can get, right? It loads quickly, and as you start typing your web search, it starts completing it for you based on what people have typed before. It even tries to load answers for you as you continue typing. And so it's reducing your time between your intention of your web search and your first action. And in fact, that is what Larry wanted to do with our wearable computers. He wants to get it so that the computer is almost mind reading and provides you information as you need it, just in time. Um, and one of the things that allows you to do is make human to human interaction better. It allows you to operate at a higher level. Now I'm going to show you uh, something that we, that's being done with Google Glass right now, where there's actually a remote scribe who's sort of acting as an intelligent agent. And what the scribe does is help this doctor um, get the information down for her electronic re health records, but also helping in diagnosis and uh, getting the information for the future. And what the great thing about this is, this is a company called Augmetics. They have reduced the amount of time a doctor spends on electronic health records from 40% to 5% of their day. And patients love this because you get more face time with their doctor. I don't know about you, but when I'm with my doctor, I would say the majority of the time he's actually typing on his laptop and not looking at me. I've learned just to talk to him as he types so he can get the information in there so he has it for the future. What they're starting to do is using these wearable computers so that it, the technology, the, the, the record keeping, and so the augmentation gets out of the way. Let me play, play that for you. The most rewarding part of being a primary care physician is the relationship that we have with our patients. It was love at first sight, I'll tell you. <laughs> first we hug. Very unprofessional, but I love it. There was a time when I was not doing so well, and she called me home to check up on me. You'll get through this. And it, really, it really touched me. Glass, can you pull up the healthcare maintenance for Micah? I see that you're overdue for a couple blood tests, nothing that's critical. Class allows us to stay in the moment. I do tend to feel a little, maybe a little nauseous. It clicked with me when she wasn't sitting at the computer all the time. But no sign of symptoms. She was really able to look me in the eye, and that made it a lot easier for us to interact. A couple more deep breaths for me. <gasps> it's a service called Augmetics. If we need information, it's brought to us. We don't need to go to the computer to get it. Glass, could you pull up what I said about her thyroid nodule from last year? Yeah, so it's completely unchanged from last year. It's hard for patients to remember everything that we told them to do. As things are being said, notes are being created live in real time. Here's your after visit summary. Here were your vitals from today. In the past, almost a third of my day was spent with my computer. Now I spend maybe one to two minutes per patient. Since she has the Google Glass, she is not as rushed, honestly not as rushed. Uh, my middle son is going to be Santa again. His... Glass gives us a little bit more time to interact and get to know our patients. Okay, let me take a look. Yeah. Oh, there you are. Oh. That's what makes the job really fun. Now I'm going to apologize ahead of time for all the corporate looking videos. Most of my academic talks has much more academic stuff, but when preparing this talk, you know, some of these things are just so on point for me that I decided to include them anyways. You can do this sort of stuff with other wearable computers as well, it's just this is the one I've been working on. It has a lot of my lessons built into it. Now one of the things that also you can do with these wearable computers is improving job training. So with that patient, I was just talking uh, to a medical doctor in Munich yesterday. And he's a surgeon, and he's been a student, he's a student surgeon, and one of the things he's discovered is that all experienced surgeons, when they are evaluating how well you're performing, give about the same feedback. They're talking about economy of movement. And one of the things that he found very exciting about having these wearable computers is that the remote surgeon, the expert, can look out of your eyes and see your hands and play back what it is you did during the surgery and give you some expert guidance on what it is that you could have done more efficiently. And it turns out it's very consistent across expert doctors, the advice they give. Well, you can imagine 
that in the future we can actually have a system that not only looks at things like you know how how efficient you're you're working for improving your your technique, but also as you go to unclamp that artery, that uh, for uh, after you've done the the, the tumor resection, uh, you unclamp the army artery and automatically starts giving you the blood pressure of the patient, because it knows that's going to be an issue. So this first person perspective can really help with this job training in the future. Now we're not there yet, um, and we'll talk about that in the future. But you can imagine this idea of actually having on-the-job training uh, 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 be helped with these wearable computers. Um, this is uh, something about firefighting. I worked with the um, Bremen Firefighting uh, Brigade for a while. And one of the things they really liked about this is sort of the same thing as the surgeons. They want to see how you move, what you do, what procedure there was. They also like giving their recruits the tools they needed to better handle the situation. And a lot of that is providing information just in time again. And let me show you uh, a video on what uh, a firefighter uh, took, did with glass once he got a hold of it. And again, this was independent of me. This guy is just a programmer and a firefighter, and we discovered that this is what he was doing with glass. This is firefighter Patrick Jackson, glassware developer. Okay, glass, show floor plan. He wants to give firefighters hands-free access to the information they need when they need it. So one day, firefighters everywhere can work faster, safer, smarter. Okay, Glass, show extraction diagram. 2001 Ford Expedition. Cut right here. Because every moment on the front lines is a chance to keep pushing what Glass can do. This is Patrick Jackson, firefighter, developer, and fearless explorer. Now, one of the things that's exciting about this stuff is this is not just for first responders, this is not just for doctors, this is for the everyday person. One of the things you can do with glasses is turn-by-turn -turn instructions. I will tell you that having it on your eyeball is a whole lot better than having it in your car or on your phone. Um, one of the reasons is because it focuses out there at the car in front of you so you can see what's going on. If you're using it while biking down a trail, your focus is actually on the trail in front of you, not on your, your handlebars. The other thing that's really great about this um, is that it's, it's always in the same location, right, relative to your eyeball. You just glance at it and use it. And this is one distinction I want to make about these wearable computers. Um, when we made eyeglasses hundreds of years ago, we started wearing these things and we don't think about them, right? You put on your eyeglasses in the morning and you don't think about it again, you see through them, right? You see with them. Can we make wearable computers that augment our brains in the same way? Can we make machines that we think through that augment our ability to think the same way eyeglasses augment our ability to see? And that's why I think we're trying to get to more and more. We can actually start integrating this intelligence this, uh, 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 these artificial intelligence to provide us information as we need it so we can think more clearly and more quickly. Um, the turn-by-turn -turn navigation, if you've never used it on, on a heads-up display, it, will, it really is an amazing change, uh, especially if you're doing something like biking or walking a, on a hiking trail. Now, another thing I'd like to share with you is a way to augment y your abilities with language. For example, one of the things that's hit the press recently is something called uh, 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 Google's Pixel Buds which uh, do speech translation. Let me show you what that looks like on glass.
Do you have might? Oh, might. Sure, might. Uh, please, please, please. Okay, let's start chat. Hello, Mohammed. How are you? Nice to meet you. Thank you. It's very good to be here. This must be the famous Palm Island. It's very impressive. Yes, definitely. <laughs> So this is one of the companies that spun off on uh, uh, doing, uh, taking class and doing this sort of work. We did something similar to Georgia Tech, but believe it or not, our videos are even worse than this. Um, so let me skip up forward here. Oh, come on. There we go. So this sort of thing not, not only works with speech, but with text as well. Here's an example of using the wearable computer to take a sign and translate it from English to Spanish. For me, uh, I did it the other way around. I was in Mexico, and I was visiting a museum where all the signage was in Spanish. And let me tell you, I enjoyed the museum a whole lot more when I was using the wearable computer to translate the signs to English so I could actually read them. Another thing we're seeing right now is uh, people using these wearable computers to help deal with remote di diagnosis and repair. Um, this idea of a remote expert is very common in the field. Uh, and so you have some local technician who maybe doesn't have as much experience as a, a, a more senior technician, and he finds something in a power plant, say, that he hasn't seen before. And so he can call up a, re a remote uh, expert and have that expert uh, look through his eyes and see what uh, the problem is, and then guide him step by step through the problem and its solution. In this way, not only does the, the techni local technician get more training, but also the remote expert can start creating more and more case studies of how to, uh, uh, how to improve the diagnostics and the repair of these sort of systems. Now, what's great about this, you can imagine using that data that we're getting during these interactions to help train up a machine learning system to help provide these resources more seamlessly, more quickly. I will tell you, having been a remote expert, that part of the problem is simply keeping up with the local technician. You, you have all these resources that you're trying to engage and pull into the guy's visual field so he can see the right sections of the manual, and it takes a lot of effort and it's very slow. Having something that automatically pulls that up those resources you might use and it helps augment your ability to help that local technician would be a major a benefit here. Now, Another thing I'd like to mention is the fact that these systems not only can help augment intellect, they can help reduce disability. This is Jim Foley. Uh, Jim Foley is one of the people who actually founded the field of computer graphics. But as he's gotten older, he's starting to lose his hearing. So one of the things he did with a, his wearable computer is made a system that helps caption the, his interactions with students. In this case, he's handed his cell phone to Jay, who's uh, uh, inter uh, talking with him. And Jay talks into the phone, and as Jay speaks, it shows up in his head-up display as a, a transcription. Now, most of the time, Jim has enough remaining hearing and enough uh, lip-reading ability and enough context that he knows what you're saying. But if I'm saying something like, can I meet February 3rd, you can see the February on the lips, but maybe not the 3rd. And so he can glance up at the screen, catch up with the conversation, and get right back into it. And a lot of this sort of interaction is about speed so that you know, people don't get uh, frustrated and people don't think, well, believe it or not, the slower you interact, the uh, dumber people think you are. And so when, you when you're trying to make these sort of um, enabling technologies, you try to keep up the pace of conversation. Now, I took this system with me to a nursing home where my father is. And there, there was somebody who's been deaf from age two and a half. And I gave it to him because he was curious about it. And we were signing together. And, and I said, here, let's try something. Um, I want you to, to look at the screen whenever you don't know what the other person's saying, and that will give you some, some information. And then I grabbed another uh, person visiting the nursing home, some random family member who'd never seen me before or been the person I was working with. And I said, why don't you two have a conversation? And without any more in instruction, these two started going back and forth, and you could see Ben's face get this big smile on it. 
as he's going, oh my word, this just opens up my, my life, right? My ability to communicate has just improved so much. And so this idea of using things like this, these speech recognition and translation systems to enable communication between humans really sort of opens things up. Let me show a more basic system for helping people with disabilities. This is Greg. Greg is one of my colleagues on Glass. He made his first wearable computer with a heads-up display in 1994, a year after I made mine. And he uses his system because he can't read. He has a form of something similar to dyslexia, and he has very limited ability to understand text. However, he's absolutely brilliant. So what he does, he made his wearable computer, and now he uses Glass for this, so that he can actually uh, uh, get an email in, and it reads it to him. Right? And how Glass does that is it has a little bone conducting transducer here that actually vibrates your skull, sends the audio to your cochlea bypassing your eardrum, and so it keeps it private. And so in the middle of a meeting, you can actually, you know, if I sit really close to him, I can hear him actually taking notes and having it read the notes to him. Um, he uses a one-handed keyboard uh, very similar to the one that apparently I didn't put in my pocket. Excuse me. You can ask me later to see my Twiddler. Um, that's unlike me. Um, so Greg has uh, also, whenever he writes an email, he'll have the wearable computer read it back to him to make sure he didn't misspell things or do grammar improperly. He can hear it just fine. He just has trouble writing it. Now, this device, uh, we got the first operating one in 2012, something that looks like this. The first, um, um, the, uh, uh, first fully integrated one I think I had done in December 2010, but this is the first, thing, the first time we had something that looked like this in 2012. We sold this on the open market between 2014 and 2015. It includes a lot of technology and you can see listed here. But one of the things I want to emphasize is that this technology came from a long history of, of research and work in academia and industry, and a lot of this stuff was government funded. Um, here's a list of things of reasons why we can only do this now, but I'm going to focus on just a couple of them. The first one I want to emphasize is that this idea is quite old. In fact, Van Iver Bush, when he wrote the paper, As We May Think, in the Life Magazine version of this article, not the Atlantic Monthly one, he actually talks about scientists having cameras on their foreheads where they can take pictures of their experiments and link it to their notes. They can actually link the notes to each other on microfiche, right, this little really tiny printing. He talks about a machine that moves it from one place to another depending on which word and which picture you pick on. He actually basically invented hypertext. He actually described the web as we know it and wearable computers. And if you look at the history of the founders of computing, if you look at J.C.R. Licklider or Doug Engelbart, these people who are famous for their demonstrations and for their funding of, of uh, computer science and where we got today, a lot of times they're talking about wearable computers in their original writing. It just wasn't possible back then. We see then through a, a lot of government sponsorship, Things like uh, uh, Evan Sutherland's Sword of Damocles, where we have the first AR and first VR system. Um, we see uh, Hubert Upton, who was losing his hearing, much like Jim Foley did, uh, using an augmented reality display to help people lip read better. And then he took that idea, his idea of helping people with disabilities, in particular himself, and then started applying it to head up displays for uh, helicopters for the military. These displays were then um, invested in by the government, and a company called Copen started making these little small displays back in 1990. Those displays got into camcorders and, and digital cameras, and now if you look at today's VR systems or AR systems, they all can trace their lineage back to this initial funding uh, by the government in this area. I had a little bit of something to do with uh, Bluetooth, my apologies. Um, it's a standard called IEEE 802.15. I was giving a demonstration to FedEx back in 1995, and they want to actually incorporate the electronics they're putting on their carriers um, in a body-centered network. And I said, there's nothing out there that's appropriate. And so because of my research at MIT, um, I was able to identify the problem, and then FedEx took the problem and started founding an IEEE standard for it called AO2.15. This eventually in in involved uh, Zigbee and Bluetooth, and we have that wireless standard today. Um, so the cameras you see, the systems that allow, allow us to take a picture and actually translate the text into Spanish, that was started by a, a work at NASA with JPL, a guy named Eric Folsom, and uh, that's how we got our CMOS cameras. 
Um, this is something I know personally about. The IMUs, the, the gyros and accelerometers, the motion sensors in glass, I can trace directly back to Eric Foxlin, who was uh, a colleague of mine at MIT and a student uh, back in the 90s. He actually started making the, the MEMS accelerometers back then. Um, and that was funded by uh, NASA, AFSOR, NRL, and Intersense, this company, then got lots of SBIRs, Small Business uh, Innovative Research Programs, uh, to get this stuff out the door. GPS, we all know, is one of the biggest successes uh, as far as something that everybody uses. But one of the things that people don't, don't recognize is that speech recognition is probably even, in some senses, a bigger success of this government and uh, 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 university cooperation. Speech recognition had, took a long time coming. There was decades of investments, $100 million put into this, way before there was a Google or Facebook. And we see people like uh, uh, John McCool at BBN, who has very tight t t t um, ties with BU and MIT, MIT itself, uh, Carnegie Mellon with the Sphinx system, even before that HMM work that they were doing. Um, there was a lot of competition and cooperation to get the algorithms to the stage, we can start using these big data approaches and really creating the systems you currently use on your smartphones. So all this technology finally came together in about 2010, and I, and, and I called up um, Sergey Brin and said, you haven't seen our, the wearable technology in a while, perhaps you want to take a look and come out to, to Georgia Tech and see some demos. It turned out these guys had already decided the time was right. And the next thing I knew, I was out on a plane working on Google Glass. And now we're actually seeing wearable computing finally happen. However, to me, the exciting stuff is yet to come. Can you imagine if we can actually uh, have a system that really was intelligent? The, we are very good at making the world's best Go player or the, a system that can look at all the images on the web and pull out the cats. But we still do not have the ability to have a machine have the same perception and navigation abilities of a two-year-old. Our AIs cannot live in the human world. They don't even have any training data for it. So what I'm trying to do personally is put cameras where my eyes are, microphones where my ears are, put motion sensors on my wrists, actually even look into my brain and see what I'm attending, and try to actually collect enough data from a system that already is intelligent, namely me, so I can actually try to make an AI that can live in the real world and help me on a second-second basis and basically augment my brain much the way my eyeglasses augment my eyes. Um, thank you very much, and uh, do we take questions now? Thank you. We'll take a couple questions and then invite the panelists up. Okay, um, I, I have two short questions. One, uh, from what you show us on wearable uh, computers, is there actually research that is specialized on them, or it's mainly taking you know, other parts of AI and making it more accessible? Um, for me and some of my colleagues uh, in the International Symposium on Wearable Computing, um, we do a lot of pattern recognition and machine learning stuff that leverages being on body. And so there is a community of people worldwide, and, and many fa in ma matter of fact, most of it's done in Europe, which is very specifically making AI technologies for the body. Um, okay. So it's very wearables focused. Okay, and then at the end of the talk, I kind of felt that you went ahead and then missed it. So in DARPA, we have a, we have a program that is called Lifelong Learning Machines, mm -hmm. where the idea is to have AI that learns just like your brain learns. So you, you wouldn't say that the two-year-old already had a two years of training set, and that's why he navigates it. Mm -hmm. Okay, he learns on the go. And taking everything that you have and putting it back and freezing the machine after that, it's kind of like going to the old AI while you actually have the capability yeah. to collect data on the go. So why, when you collect data on the go, you go back to the old ways instead of doing the lifelong learning? Well, one of the things is there's a difference between offline learning and online learning, and oftentimes you do the offline learning to get bootstrapped. What I really want to do is have uh, the computation locally so that you can actually look at a reward system where the agent learns to how to help you in a timely manner and then gets rewarded from that and learns on, online as it goes. Um, so yeah, I mean, this, it's, a, it's a fine point, um, uh, and I think it's a, a very good point. Thanks. Thank you again. Thank you.